It is really good to be with you today. I really appreciate Dr. Chuck Fountain inviting me to come to you. I'm here on the campus of Southern Nazarene University and glad to be with my friends in Louisiana today. Uh, the the uh, topic for our discussion for this hour is a theology of constancy in an inconsistent world. With all of the inconsistency and the chaos going on, how do we find a, a, a secure theological foundation that holds us steady in the midst of all of the things that are going on? So, let's talk about it. In the last two minutes of the big game, when we are down by five points, I want my favorite quarterback to be calm, cool, and collected and consistent. When there's chaos all around him with 300-pound linemen chasing him all over the field, I want him to be able to tune out the noise, slow down the game, speed up his feet, and remember the plays that they practiced back in spring training. If he will stay focused and play his game and be consistent, that's going to give us the best chance of winning the game. Amen? Amen. In the same way, in the midst of all of the craziness of the COVID pandemic, I want my favorite pastor <laughs> to be calm, cool, and collected and consistent. When there is chaos all around her and 300-pound decisions chasing her all over the office, I want her to be able to tune out all the noise, slow down the game, speed up her feet, and just remember the skills and the things that she practiced back in spring training. If she will just remember what she's been taught and if she will stay focused and consistent, that is going to give us the best chance to win the game. Amen? <laughs> and so, that's what we're going to talk about today. How do pastors stay calm, cool, collected, and consistent when everything around them is chaotic and changing every day and every week? When our lay people are trying to make sense out of this chaotic world that we're living in, they expect us as pastors to tune out the noise, slow down the game, speed up our feet, and remember how to have a solid and secure theological foundation that holds us steady in the very midst of the chaos that we're dealing with. And so, i got to have a whiteboard if I'm going to teach this, this morning. Um, we have, if you can read this, we've got this consistent theology up here at 35,000 feet. And then we've got all of this chaos going on down here. This doesn't, really, this doesn't really spell anything. This is just all of the chaos that's going on down here at ground level. And so in order to survive down here, you've got to have this view from 35,000 feet to help you see the big picture. Ready, ready, ready? Let's go. Number one, let's talk about the, the inconsistent chaos down here at ground level. This COVID pandemic has completely upset the fruit basket. Uh, it switched all the price tags. It's turned everything upside down. All kinds of chaos. Everyone is a beginner. Sunday, March 15th, 2020, without any warning, we all went from preaching to a full congregation inside the sanctuary one morning, and then the very next Sunday, we were trying to figure out how to do online worship. Back in March of 2020, I didn't even know how to spell Zoom, and now I'm on a Zoom call almost every day of my life. It seems like we've had to unlearn everything and then relearn everything. We've had to develop a whole new set of skills. 
I think the two most overused words of 2020 are fluid and pivot. I hate those two words. Oh, we've got to be fluid. We've got to be able to pivot and move in a new direction. I hate those two words, but guys, we, ladies, we've, we've got to be fluid so that we can pivot in the midst of all of this inconsistent chaos that we're fighting about and fighting with. You know, back in the old days when I was a young pastor, we used to say that, that if the church was, the, the, the church was usually five years behind the times. So culture and society was doing this, and the church was about five years behind the times. And that was, we just thought that was normal. Today, we can't even be five days behind the times. If we do, we are ancient. And that's not much of an exaggeration. Truth of the matter is, we, got, we ought to get ahead of the time, but that's another lecture for another day. In some ways, it seems like we are now working in, in, in B.C. and A.C., before COVID and after COVID. And so when I'm reading a book, and I see that this book was written in 2017, that wasn't long ago, that's just a couple of years ago. But I got to think, this book was written before COVID. And it's still a good book. It's still a valuable book. But you've got to learn how to take that book written in 2017 or 1997, or, and you've got to translate that into AC time after COVID time in order to understand it contextually. This year-long pandemic has changed everything for everybody. And so changes that it was going to take 10 years to make, we made those changes literally overnight. And so when we get out a ways 2030, 2040, and when we look back at the things that have changed, I have a feeling we're going to trace a lot of the new things going on 10 or 20 years We're going to trace all of that all the way back to the pandemic of 2020. And and you'll be able to see this this, this changed. That's because of what happened in the the pandemic of 2020. Let me show you how that works. Uh, Back here in 1914, you had World War I, the Great War, 1914. And uh, then right, that went to 1917 or something. And then 1918, you had the Spanish flu that killed millions of people. Guess what? In this time before 1914, Christia- in Europe, in Europe, Christianity and the church was alive and well. People were going to church. There were all kinds of Christians in Europe before 1914. After the, and this, um, this pandemic, uh, Spanish flu went to about 1920. So in the span of these six years, when you look at the church and Christianity after these two events, there is almost no Christianity, most no churches, no people going to church after 1920. And if it's these two massive events, this is, this is sort of a macro example of what happened with the church alive and well, and then the church going nowhere after 1920. And so we are going to see those, those macro changes happening in our society, and you will have lived through the panic that started the whole thing. So whether it's on a macro level or a micro level for your pastor, there are hundreds of decisions that he or she has to make on a regular, daily, weekly basis. And I've got some of the decisions there in your notes. I mean, how do we do effective online worship? Uh, How does, since we're online, how does that change the way I preach? What do you do for the children? 
of what do you do for the teenagers? We got all of these decisions that we're trying to make because of all of the chaos that is going on as a result of this pandemic and what is, gonna, what is life going to be like after the pandemic? And so without even knowing who your pastor is, I can guarantee you, call him up this Sunday, call her up this Sunday. I can guarantee you that your pastor is exhausted. And of course, hey pastor, are you exalted? Exhausted. No, I'm fine. I never let me let, never let them see me sweat. <laughs> yeah, they pretend like they're doing okay. I, I guarantee you they're exhausted. Because every day living in this chaos going on with our pandemic, they are trying to make heart and <clears throat> Even though they made good decisions last week, this week's crisis is completely different. It doesn't matter if they survived last week. This week is a whole new crisis. Oh, is it time to come back together and invite everybody back to church? Or should we stay home and do virtual? Uh, Should we wear a mask or not wear a mask? And I can guarantee you another thing. Half of your church board leans one direction and a half of them lean the other direction, which always makes it exciting for your pastor. There are three things that I know. There are three things that I know. Number one, we can't stay the same. Number two, we're never going back to the old normal. So number three, we either change or die. And that's not exaggerating very much. We can't stay the same. We can't go back to the old normal, which, of course, we'd love to do, but you can't. Number three, in the midst of all of this inconsistency and chaos, we've got to change or die. Well, how do you know what to do with all of this? The only way you know how to survive all of the inconsistent chaos is because up here at 35,000 feet, you've got a consistent theology that gives you a view of the whole picture. Does that make sense? Here's the day-to-day chaos. Here, up here in this theological plane that you're on today, part of this ministry assessment is trying to help you get you a 35,000-foot theological view of ministry. If you don't have this, then you get consumed by this. So 35,000 feet, this is one book that you ought to have on your shelf and one book that you ought to read on a regular basis. If there is one textbook to go along with this really short Uh, lecture that I'm giving you today, it would be Tom Oden's book, Pastoral Theology. Pastoral Theology. My book, I have taught from this book for 25 years. I've got tape holding my book together. I've even lost a couple of pages. This book is invaluable. Oden says on page three, I mean like two pages into the book, Oden says, we, with all of, the, all of the different things you're going to be doing in ministry, the way to have a consistent theology is to, is to bring everything back to the life of Christ. Everything, every part of our ministerial work is going to be based on the life of Christ. And so the, the, way you, the way you survive all of the chaos is that you understand what it's like to, to know and be clear about the life of Christ. That's why you read your Bible. That's why you do your studies in the theology. And so when you are trying to survive all of this and you're going, what's my next move? What do we do here? How in the world do I figure all of this out? 
you've got to have a consistent theological foundation, a consistent view of, of understanding the Bible and understanding uh, Wesleyan, Arminian, Nazarene theology that then helps you sort out the chaos. Odin is going to give you, it's there in your notes, Odin is going to give you the theological consistency to help you understand every inconsistency that you're going to face in your theological practice. You with me? Here's, here's this theological consistency that helps you sort out the chaotic inconsistency going on in our world every day. And so as you are preparing for ministry and preparing for ordination, you really do need to be serious about your theological studies. Hello. Hello. Can I say that again? <laughs> you, you need to be serious about your theological studies so you can get this thing figured out so when you're in the midst of a busy, chaotic moment in, of life, you, you can figure out what to do. And you, you can't just make this up as you go along. You, you can't say, oh, I, I, don't know what it, I don't know what to do. I, I'll, I'll flip a coin and, and see how it, you can't do that. You can't give one answer to somebody on Tuesday and then give another a different answer to a different person on Thursday. There's got to be this consistency about what you're doing. And so in the midst of all of this chaos, as your people are trying to make sense of this world that they are trapped in five days a week, six days a week, and those your, your people come to church to hear you preach or teach on Sunday, listen carefully, they are listening for a word from the Lord. Your people trapped in this chaos going, what in the world is going on here? How do we sort all of this out? They come to church on Sunday and they're listening for a word from the Lord from their pastor, especially in a world where our social media algorithms tend to uh, ham, tend to push us to one extreme or the other, you've got to stay centered in the life of Christ. They can't come from their political extremes and then come to church and on Sunday hear you preaching out of your extreme, whichever side that's on. You have to have hammered out a consistent theological foundation that lets you see the big picture of the world so that Sunday after Sunday you can preach a good, solid gospel message. And then throughout the week, you try to figure out how to be a good pastor, a good, caring pastor for your people. You, you've got you've to have this figured out. Let me give you an example. I, 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 pastoring out in California, up in Fresno, California, I, uh, I just finished the funeral for a, a young man who had hung himself in his prison cell. <laughs> not, not, a, not, a, not a real good boy, okay? He's in prison for some really bad stuff. It was so bad, he got to a point, hung himself in prison, and I'm doing his funeral because his mother is a part of our church. After the funeral, the mother comes and sort of, sort of, kind of gets up in my space and asks me, "Is my son in heaven today? Is my son in heaven today?" And I don't know is not an acceptable answer. I mean, words have to come out of your mouth. You've, I mean, she's standing right here. Words have to come out of your mouth. And I am not going to say, well, I sort of kind of think your son is roasting in hell today. 
And I'm obviously not going to say, oh, I'm sure he's walking the streets of gold with Jesus right now. I'm not going to say that either. I'm not quite sure where he is. Friends, it, it took me 10 years of pastoral ministry to figure out what to say to that mother. <laughs> it took me 10 years of saying the wrong thing to finally figure out the right thing to say to this mother. Is my son in heaven? I got to say something. And what I finally decided over years of ministry, I finally, I looked her in the eye and I said, my dear, I called her by name. My dear, I believe that your son is in the hands of a loving and just God who knows how to care for him better than we do. I, I believe that your son is in the hands of a loving and just God who knows how to care for him better than than we do. Now, I'm, I'm not sure what part of that statement she heard, but that is, the most, that is the most theologically accurate thing I know how to say when she asks me, is my son in heaven? Friends, our theology matters. Our words matter. And we need this consistent, constant theological foundation view in order to respond to all of the hundreds of questions that your people are going to ask you. Now, so you got number one, you got all of this inconsistent chaos going on in our lives every day. Number two, you've got this 35,000 foot view out your airplane window that lets you see the big, lets you see the big picture. Um, here's, here's number three. Number three, you've got, to, you've got to put all of this together. You've got to find the balance between bringing these worlds together. And so uh, getting, being, you can't be trapped down here, and you can't live up here all day either. You've got to, you've got to be able to come out of this chaos, come up here and get the, get the big picture view, and then bring that view back down to your people, okay? And that's how we win the game. Uh, my friend and author Leonard Sweet says that we need to have contextual intelligence. Leonard Sweet says we need to have contextual intelligence. It's, it, the Bible tells us that we need to be like the men of Issachar, one of the tribes of Israel, Issachar, I-S-S-A-C-H-A-R, men of Issachar. First of all, real quick, and you've got it there in your notes. I, 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 I don't have the time. I do, but you don't. I don't either. Um, so we're not going to take the time to give you the whole nine yards on contextual intelligence. I've got it there in your notes. Carefully fill in some blanks there. Here we go. You ready? Contextual intelligence, being able to put these two things together. Contextual intelligence is the ability to look at a situation from all sides. To be able to look at a situation from all sides and accurately read between the lines in order that you are able to understand the current context so that then you can make the correct decisions about what we're supposed to be doing, right? Let me go over that again. Contextual intelligence is the ability to look at a situation from all different sides and then accurately read between the lines so that you understand the current context and then you're able to to make a decision, even in the midst of this chaos, if you've been able to have some contextual intelligence, then you're able to come back down here and make some sense out of the chaos. We have to continually work at cultivating a high contextual intelligence that involves growing in the, in the ability to read the complex threads surrounding 
any situation that we're dealing with. Geographic, temporal, cultural, economic, organizational, emotional, personality, political, all of these different threads that are coming together to make this situation what it is, you've got to be able to, number one, see all of those threads, and then you've be able, got to be able to read all of those threads so that we know how to solve the specific challenge that you are facing. Um, I wish I had more time there, but I don't. Let me, let me give you an example. I thought of this example while I was putting this lecture together. Um, so I pastored a bunch of years in Fresno, California, and then I pastored a bunch of years in Bakersfield, California. So let me tell you about Robert and Connie. Uh, Robert, one of my favorite guys, very supportive, wanted to see great things happen for the church, great spirit, just a, a great Christian, and on my church board. But I discovered over the first few months, maybe the first year of being there at Bakersfield First, I began to realize that any time I brought up an idea there in board meeting, uh, Robert's first response to that idea was usually not very positive. Eh, I don't, I don't, I don't think we should do that. And so here's a bunch of great, I, I mean, great ideas. I thought they were great, and I lay them out in board meeting. And Robert's first response was, and sort, of, and the rest of the board sort of did, sort of took their lead from Robert. Eh, he, he's not very excited about that idea. Well, a couple more months went by, and I, and I just happened to be over in that part of town. Uh, Robert and Connie owned one of the high-end uh, furniture stores in town. And I was over in that part of town, and, and, and I would always just, you know, drop in and say, hey, how you doing, and sort of pray for them there in, the, in their business. And this one day, I, I was going, you know, meeting them in their store, and I, I just happened to say to Robert, hey, Robert. I'm thinking about this and this and this, and I sort of laid out on this plan that we were working on. I'm thinking this and this and this and this. And Robert went, oh, oh yeah. And so I was able to share some of my idea with, with Robert. Guess what? A couple of weeks later in board meeting, when that idea hit the floor, guess what? Robert was able to go, you know, Pastor, I've been thinking about that. I, I think that's a great idea. Why don't we do that? Can, can you figure out what was happening here? You don't know Robert or Connie, do you? Here's what's happening. Robert, a little more negative side, had the opportunity to run this idea past his wife, Connie, who's much more of the positive person of the two. And so when, when Robert and Connie are talking through the day and Robert's going, hey, pastor's talking to me about this plan or this idea, Connie would say, I think that's a great idea. Well, then when Robert's sitting in board meeting a couple of weeks later, Robert goes, I think that's a great idea. Now, we're, <laughs> we're talking about contextual intelligence. And it's my job as the pastor to, to see the issues going on here at Bakersfield First Church and then be able to read between the lines, guess what? I learned to sort of, oh, by the way, happen to make a trip over to Robert and Connie's store about a week or two before board meeting and would, would sort of, hey, Robert, I've been thinking. And you know what? I've discovered over the years if you surprise your board members with, hey, I got a great idea, a lot of times they're not going to be that excited about your idea if you surprise them. And in board meeting, if you will go, hey, you know, we've been thinking about doing this and this, and we're, we're not going to vote on this tonight, but I've been thinking, I wondered if we could do this and this and this. Just, what do you guys think about that? And what I learned as a young pastor is that whether it's Robert Taylor or Gary Elliott or Gary Young or Don Hall or Richard Winicky or Jim, if you'll give them time to think about it, you begin to have contextual intelligence. And in the midst of the chaos of trying to make the right decision, do we have enough money to do that? You're able to bring some consistency and some contextual intelligence 
into the conversation, right? Let's keep moving. Not only contextual intelligence, but then we've got to be like the men and women of Issachar. First Chronicles, not First Corinthians, First Chronicles, chapter 12. Um, you've got this big long list of all of the different tribes of Israel that are sending uh, men and soldiers, whatever, uh, to help David uh, build the, the United Kingdom of Israel back in his day, back in the years 1000 or so. And so this is really just a boring list. Uh, Reuben gave this many and Gad gave this many and, you know, all of the different tribes. And in the middle of this sort of kind of boring list, you read this little gem tucked away in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. The men from Issachar, you ready? The men from Issachar who understood their time and then knew what Israel should do. That is a great little, little section of Scripture. The men of Issachar who understood their times and then knew what Israel should do. These men and women of Issachar became the strategy makers and the vision casters who knew what Israel needed to do over the next two or three months, the next two or three years, the next 20 or 30 years. And they became the ones that led Israel through some of the challenging times of their history. Listen, folks, you and I, we need to be men and women of Issachar who have a solid 35,000-foot theological foundation visionary thing that we have done our homework. We have worked out in spring training, and we've got this thing sorted out, how to be consistent about all of this. And then in the midst of the craziness of any particular day, we can begin to choose the best path going forward, even when everybody else is feeling pretty crazy and chaotic. And, of course, it, it is this uh, intersection and interaction between these two things that helps us make the right decision, stay calm, slow the de game down, speed our feet up. You know, we've got we to gotta make some decisions here. It's either change or die. But we don't just make crazy decisions We've got this consistency that holds us steady so that we know how to win the game. Amen? Well, let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. Um, so um, I I've said all of this for the past 30 minutes so that I could say what I'm going to tell you right now. So wake up. Wake up the person next to you or wake yourself up. I, I said all of this so I could tell you this is the best part. This is, <laughs> this is the only thing you're going to remember from, from my whole lecture, but this, it's, it's gonna, this is going to be good. You ready, 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 ready? Here you go. <laughs> what I've been talking the whole time, we've got to learn how to have an open hand and a closed hand. <laughs> Don't you think that's profound? Uh, one of my students, I, I was in the middle of a lecture one day in pastoral leadership class using, using Tom, Ord's, Tom Oden's book, and one of my students, Ben Clippert, said, what, Dr. Samples, you've you got to have an open hand and a closed hand. And immediately, my brain, the light bulbs go on, I'm going, Ben, I like the sound of that, tell me some more. And actually, he did. He explained, he'd been thinking about this. So in the midst of all of the, the fast-paced chaos, inconsistency of our day, we've we, we got to have an open hand. And, and we've got to hold on to things loosely. Here's my two words again. So that we can be fluid and pivot as things change. A COVID pandemic has hit. We've got to go everything online. <laughs> Baby, you've got, you've got to have an open hand 
to be able to juggle all of this, all of these new decisions, all of this chaos, you, you've got to have a, a flexible, fluid, open hand that, that helps you make good, wise decision based on contextual intelligence and spiritual discernment. But then you've got to have a closed hand that holds firmly to theological truth, theological foundations, your solid Wesleyan, Arminian, Nazarene theology, and the life of Christ, you've got to have something that you hold on to securely here that holds you steady or else you're going to be blown about by every wind of doctrine, okay? So you've got to have an open hand that lets you pivot and move. You've got to have some pillars that you have driven down into the granite rock that holds you steady when the winds are going to blow. And you don't have time for, for a lot of this, but can, can you can, just hold, your, hold both of your hands open in front of you? <laughs> Is that going to work? What happens if we just hold all of this in the middle of all of this chaos? We just have both hands open and everything just drop. We don't, we don't really have any, we don't have any theological foundation about what we're doing. And at the same time, <laughs> right? You can't have both hands closed. We're always going to do what we've always done so that we always get what we've always got. I'm not changing a thing. You, you can't open and closed. Fluid, solid. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19. Behold, God says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. <laughs> behold, I'm doing a new thing. Baby, you, you got to have that hand open in order to catch the new thing that God is doing. But then Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> Get this. This is, this is the paradox of the gospel. The God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever is doing a new thing. You get those two open and closed hands sorted out and figured out and balanced, that's when you get to do great ministry. Let me close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for those who are a part of this ministry assessment uh, weekend. I thank you for the work that they are doing. I thank you for the studies that they are doing. I thank you for the theological work that sometimes can be really hard to sort through all of that. Thank you, Father, for the time and the effort and the reading and falling asleep with the book in their lap. But, Father, help them to get their theological studies figured out so they've got that good 35,000-foot consistent thing life of Christ thing, Wesleyan, Arminian, Nazarene theological foundations got figured out so that they can come down in the midst of all of the chaos of today and with an open hand and a closed hand make good decisions. Be with them, Father, in all the ways that they need your help. Be with the one that's listening today that needs you more than all the rest. Make your presence known and aware to them today. We pray all of this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless. Good to be with you. Have a great day.